Again, committing to caring well for your spouse. That's what I want to focus on today. Uh, there's a lot in that video. I chose it for a reason. And I, at times I watch a thing and I, I know people and I and know us as a church family. And so there was things in there that I was hoping that would resonate with us. And yet, um, now I'm hoping that that got you thinking about your marriage or the marriage one day that you might have. And... Um, what I wanted to, my, my message was birthed out of reflecting on the growing beauty in my marital union, but also, uh, the, what can our marriage be? Our marriage could, in my opinion, one thing that it could be is it could be a growing mirror that reflects God's beauty in the world um, into the lives of marriages around us. And uh, far from perfect, my wife was actually supposed to be in this service today, but things sick kids and different things in the week, so she's over there now. She'll watch it later, but um, I'll say that we're far, we're far from perfect. She would say the same thing, but just wanting to share some little morsels that we picked up along the way so far in case it would be an encouragement to anybody that's here or for those that are online. Um, I feel like men are called to lead. You saw that in the video, right? We've said that a lot. Um, so you're supposed to be a great example to your bride. You're uh, supposed to be the spiritual lead of your home. And yet, um, my challenge today, it, my message is to challenge each, both husbands and wives, uh, men and women, one day in those roles, or, one, or if you're currently in those roles, to function in the fullness of the beauty that God desires for us. Next week, we have a guy named Sam that's coming, who's going to share the message that's been on his heart that uh, I'm excited for him to share. It's glorifying God by knowing your wife. Um, so an aspect, he'll talk about it better, but how knowing your wife can actually bring glory to God. And I think it would likely could obviously go both ways, knowing your spouse. But I'm, I'm, while he might be focusing on the male to the female relationship, we'll see next week. For me today, I'm just talking about caring well for your spouse. So obviously spouse goes either direction, right? And in one. So caring well. Are we caring well? I mean, I hope you'd say that, yeah, like I care for my wife. I care for my husband. Like, but are we caring well? I think that the key word in this message today is well. question I want to um, propose to you guys right now is this. Did you ever consider the potential of being able to glorify God by knowing your spouse well or for caring well for them. Have you ever really considered that? A lot of people will say, like, yeah, I want to bring God glory. If I asked you, like, you know, I don't know, picking on Zach, like, Zach, you want to bring God glory with your life? I mean, you don't have to answer that, but I hope you would say yeah. And if that's true, have you ever considered that knowing your wife really well and caring for them well could really be one great way that you reflect the glory of God in this world? Um, so, and it's for all of us, I'm just kind of picking on him. I like to do that to kind of personalize, to get people either to wake him up, and he was awake, so I'm not saying he wasn't, but to connect with us. Now, so think about that, and if you hadn't, maybe there's something that you, you should glean from that answer being not the affirmative. So, um, I'm... I care more about what the Bible's going to say. I'm going to show us the word. I don't have a ton of scriptures today, but I have a handful of them. Um, but I wanted to look at the definition of commitment in a relationship, at least, you know, what dictionary would say, what, uh, what you, know, you can find on, online, giving us just kind of another aspect of a picture. Definition of commitment in a relationship. Combining the intention to be together, to have a future and to share an identity as a couple. The state of being committed can be thought of most simply as having a sense of us with a future. A sense of us with a future. Right? I mean, what God's put together, He doesn't want to be separated. And even if you're in this house today and you've been separated and have aspirations of one day being in the marriage again, let God walk with you in a beautiful way going forward in your life. So the first point I want to make is this. You might feel like I already had some points there, didn't you, Pastor? 
God continues to show me much of marital beauty is found in focusing on your spouse's needs first. I mean, for real, for real, I could translate lots of other statements in there about just focusing on other people's needs first and how God's glorified and how it's beautiful in this world, right? Um, but what, what I have been learning is, is this. And so... I think an aspect of what God wants to show us in our marriage is just saying, if I can just relentlessly stay focused on, in my case, Jen's needs, what are they? Uh, and try to focus, try to start from there versus what I want, how I want it to be, how I want it to go down. And if I can start there, um, I feel like God gives me a lot more clarity because of that. When I take that posture, not saying I always take that posture, but that's what I'm contending for, right? And so uh, if two people, a husband and wife, are both doing that, and it's just like, you're just like a bulldog on that. You're just staying on that thing, right? You know, awesome things are going to come. I guarantee you, it's if you're almost out doing one another to be about the other person first, right? You know, God will be glorified. There's no question in that. He will do amazing things. And that, that looks like a lot of things. It looks like... My day doesn't flow the way I want. Uh, different roles. Are you in the home? Are you out of the house? You know, work-wise and things like that. And, and to keep it all copacetic, like, we have expectations and stuff, but can we say, what are the needs of my spouse? And, like, God, speak to me about that, right? So going further with that, uh, the Word teaches us that we are uh, meant to become one flesh. The video reinforced that that we had up a little while ago. Um, but God's teaching me and has been teaching me that that's clearly more than a sexual thing. Yes, it's sexual in, in the confines of a marriage, but um, has a lot to do with staying committed to connecting and caring uh, well for their overall well-being. And so this, this picture of like two becoming one flesh is like two people flawed and all, beautifully working together in a, when Christ is really kept at the center, in a very synchronized, beautiful way, not saying a perfect dance where there's no flaws and steps, it's like, no, it's beautiful despite the steps on the ankles. And those moments where it's like, oh, we're not professional dancers, but man, we're together through this whole thing, we're learning together, right? That's what I'm talking about, and in moments where, you know, maybe my dancing analogy breaks down, but there's moments where our spouse just needs to carry us. And if we're focused on their needs first, that's what we're going to do, right? And, uh, and in those moments, you know, I'll share one in particular later, you know, I guess she didn't technically, physically carry me, but spiritually she carried me in the moment. Right? And so sometimes they're like small moments and they're big things, but there's just a lot of beauty in us really making the needs of our spouse first. Each person's different, right? I think we could all agree. Even probably inside of a lot of your marriages, uh, those that are single who you'll d date and marry, like a lot of different people married, right? Not carbon copies. When I was single, I thought I wanted to be somebody exactly like me. Well, Jen and I are very, very different people, and I'm thankful for that now, even though I didn't think that's what I wanted back when I was single. Um, so while we're different, I find um, for my spouse in particular, I don't know if this will resonate with anybody, but it, perhaps it will, uh, I need to stay committed to kind of relentlessly pursuing things in her life because she is many times so self, selfless and she's giving of herself. I think a lot of women are that way. Um, so it's easy for her to overlook herself, um, and you know, even if you ask, and then you kind of get the answer that like, you know, when you ask somebody a question, and like, how's it going today? Oh, it's fine. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Maybe if you ask them six times in a row, you're gonna finally get to a real answer, right? And you, maybe you don't just do it like, how are you? How are you? How are you? Like, but find a way to reach their heart, like. I believe God will give us discernment through the Holy Spirit where we can understand, is our spouse really okay? And if you know in your heart that they're not, continue to pursue that, right? So 
look for creative ways. Maybe you do it throughout the day, throughout the week, you know, and you know, just like grilling right there in the moment. But I, I know for me, I have to um, seek peace, a moment of peace where I, I either am affirmed that she truly is okay, or that I continue to gently apply pressure until I can see her be benefited by opening up, right? Um, again, it could look like it could look like a lot of different things. Uh, you know, you could ask for a task that you can help them with periodically, um, or you can maybe sense they're overwhelmed. Um, and for us, you know, four little kids, you know, one the infant, special needs, we've got lots of roles and things on our plates and stuff like that. And there's, you know, she's super strong, but there's moments where, like, you know, I'm like, okay, like. And you know, your spouse, they should be able to be a safe place and they can just vent and say things and it's like, alright, but I'm here and I'm receiving and like, you don't need me to fix anything, but like, but something's not okay. And so like, I got to care about that, right? And so, uh, can, I, can I ask how I can help? What can I do? And uh, it could be little silly things, like in my case, it's like, yeah, when you're eating your breakfast, like stick the food in the baby's mouth, that would be really, really helpful, like consistently. So like, okay, good. But like, you know, she won't just ask for help. I'm going to have to be like, well, please, like, give me something. Please, like, something more, you know. And um, it, could, it could look like that. It could be checking in on their physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional health at times, just asking different questions. Many times when we go on long car rides, I do that. I think she'll tell you she appreciates it, even though sometimes it probably drives her nuts. But, uh, you know, I'm like, I got her captive. I'm like, eight, nine hours. Good time to ask you some deep questions, lady. <laughs> you know, and so so I go for it. But I'm but I know when I can get her in a different state of mind. And so probably like oh frantic getting ready to go away, but now we're in the car and like decompress and like all right now I'm in, you're in a place where I you'll hear something more than what I'm asking. So look for things like that. Know your spouse. Uh, know their needs. Um, Look for outside supports where it's possible. It's not possible for everybody and whatnot, but you know, examples. It could be like, hey, dude, how can we? Maybe, maybe you do it, or you look for supports and help with cleaning. Or like, is there anything from like stre stress relief, and how, how can you encourage that? And like, maybe you get a gift for like a massage or like whatever it is. But just like, you know, it's you know, somebody could be like, how are you doing? And then they they'll just say, okay. They tell you, like, I'm doing horrible. And you've ever had this moment, so they just dump it all out there. You're like, oh, like, I didn't know this was coming. You know, it's like, in some ways, it's a great ministry opportunity. Well, if it's if it's your spouse, or, or if not, I hope you wouldn't be like, well, um, be well. Like, no. you know, like, like, do something. Like, help them, right? You know? So, uh, again, look at that. And, you know, guys, we're a little slow sometimes, so... You know, make sure what we're doing is actually a help versus something we think is a help that's not a help. Uh, in fairness, our wives won't always, won't always give us an honest answer on that, but check in on the things that you're doing to make sure they're really benefiting them. Uh, so these are just examples, right? But I also uh, think it's, it's things like uh, encouraging people to have uh, supportive time in their lives, time away with friends. Uh, so, you know, we have the ladies gathering, we have the guys time out, and all that. That's <laughs> still so weird to say. <laughs> Anyways, um, so we have these things inside of the church context, but even beyond the church context, and actually one thing, uh, I'm confident Pastor Ryan would say the same thing, you know, if we just like hear you guys are like hanging out together and just like doing life together and building relationships with one another, that is super encouraging to us. But I'm not saying husband and wife, that is good too. I'm talking about just people inside the church here. Like, you know, and so, but it takes effort to build those relationships. So let's build them, right? That's part of what the church is supposed to be. Not this church, but the church in general, right? So, uh, time away with friends, though. Part, we all need a village. I don't know if you've heard that before. We all need a village. Basically supports, and a lot of that is people in our lives. Some people are very rugged individuals. I got it. I don't know. Self-made man or woman, you know, kind of whatever. Kind of picture like, no, they're tough as nails type. Like I'm a farmer or whatever. Like I don't know. Like just they are strong. They they don't need much. They can make things happen. But you know, the reality is we all need people. We do. And if you believe in something different, you're lying to yourself. So for women, it's you know, 
powerful female relationships with men, one-on-one men, male relationships, and encouraging each other to make sure we're consistently building those things. You know, uh, is he here? I, Evan was here, now he's gone. Oh, there he's back there. So, like, you know, just pick this as an example. I was like, yeah, you want to go bike ride, and we're not lined up on that, but now we're doing pickleball. And, like, it doesn't matter, but, like, look for people to build relationships with, right? I don't know if I know what I'm doing there, but he's going to show me about it, you know? So, uh, what, what, I'm, what I'm sharing to you, I'm trying to model to, and I'm just trying to encourage you guys in that. Um, but we all have busy lives, and so it's going to require us, you know, stepping out and, and putting our hand out there and trying to consistently do that to, to connect with people. Uh, it can also, I, I think a point, I think many people long for deep, meaningful relationships. I don't know if you're sitting here today and, and that's, that's you, but if it's true, um, I would say few of us, m- most, many of us would say that, yeah. I mean, if I, in, if I surveyed you now and said, like, how many people in here want, like, really crappy relationships with the very, like, surface level and people that don't care about you? versus deep and meaningful relationships with people that really know you that are there for you. Obviously, I think we know how people would generally answer that question, right? So, that being said, it's like, all right, few people are willing to put their hearts out there or be a consistent, proactive initiator of these relationships. Um, Not saying Evan wouldn't have tried to do something with me sometime, but I just said, basically, bro, I ain't waiting for you. I'm going to come, right? And so, but I think as we do that, uh, and I actually challenge, when I, when I was single, that was easier to do, I felt like, for some reason, I don't know why, probably a different dynamic now with like family life and stuff and all the different new roles that I have in that, but uh, didn't change what I desired when I was single, what I desired as a married man and a pastor and father and husband, hasn't changed. We need a village. And it never will change. It doesn't matter how many gray hairs I get when I'm fully gray and all that. But, yeah, we need this. So what are we doing about it? few of us are willing to do stuff about that. Um, as a spouse, because we have busy lives, right? And I know at times, even when I try to encourage my wife and that, it's like, oh, where's this going to fit in? And I'm kind of like, yeah, but you need it. Mm-hmm. It's like, I'm like, hey, Tiffany, you know, just stop breathing for a while. Like, you need air. You need it through your lungs. So keep breathing, right? <laughs> I'm never going to tell you, stop breathing. There's things that we need. But uh, we are created in God's image. The trinity of God, of relationship, a beautiful picture. We are meant for relationship. We are not meant for less than that. Um, so as a spouse, we're meant to be a cheerleader, I believe, for one another. And... How do you do that? So you can support them and say, hey, you like need to go have this time with, with people, right? That you value, that you're pursuing, whatever it is, fill the blank. But then how can I orient my calendar to support you so you can go do that, right? For me, it looks like, all right, I got the baby with the medical needs, and like, you know, I'm definitely the backup guy. Like, I love her with all my heart. My wife is super equipped with, for Joanna with all her medical stuff, and I'm learning more. And, you know, she's, I think, safe when Jen goes away and stuff, right? But it's just kind of like, you know, easily the first time that happened, I was like, oh, how's this is gonna be? But like, Jen needed to go, so I'm like, get the heck out of here, right? And uh, we just need to do this in our lives and, and put, remove the barriers from your spouse so they don't have them so you can allow them to be blessed in that. Because I, one thing she'll say, and uh, I'm confident she's not the only person here that would say this. It's like, well, and she's introverted too, so if anybody that's in here that's introverted or people that, yeah, like, I guess, let's just say internal processor types too, like, it's like, wow, like, the amount of energy needed sometimes to be around a lot of people. It's just like, after, it's like, oh, I need to, like, detox, or, like, I need me time or something, or whatever. And I hear that, and I'm like, I, I do need me time, but, like, differently, and I'm more extroverted, so, like, I don't relate to it as much, but I do understand the, the reality of what she's communicating, and yet she will tell me many times, almost always, when she goes, it's like, oh, that was good. And I'm like, yes, because you need it. Right? And, and so uh, we can be our spouse's cheerleaders, and I think we should. Um, and you can uh, also basically just, again, look at their needs and, and say, hey, like, if you had unexpected margin in your schedule, honestly, I did a really bad job of this yesterday. I wasn't a complete epic fail, but 
example. So uh, we were supposed to have a soccer practice yesterday, kind of like an early kick off the season thing. And uh, it was raining, and I'm, I'm usually a gamer, but I told all the parents, I'm like, hey, we're shutting it down, you know, it's probably good, it was like 40 degrees and raining all day, Shelly's actually would have been there, because her son's on our team, but I was like, nah, but in that moment, um, and I, I made moments to connect with her later in the day, for sure, but when you have extra margin, can you first go to them and say, hey, like, what do you need today? I've been giving back time now. I, didn't, I wasn't going to have this time, but what do you need, right? She might be like, oh, I don't think you're good. All right, fine. But can that be our first thing? And I'm learning the power in that, even though I would say yesterday I probably could have done better in that. But just, you know, a practical thing. How can I help you today? Um, I think even just for us to know that, like, there's support there. Like, maybe the answer in that moment is I'm actually fine. But then later in the day I might need, and maybe they'll actually come down and ask you for recognizing that. So couple of scriptures as it relates to this point. You can look at uh, the book of Mark, chapter 10, verse 7 and 9. If anybody needs a Bible, you can put your hand up and get you one. If you have a Bible, good. Open it up. You have a phone. You have a Bible. That works too. And sometimes I have a ton of scriptures today, only a handful, but I uh, definitely never want my message to be, you know, uh, Pastor Joeism's alone. I want it to be anchored in the Word of God. Mark 10, 7 to 9. I'm going to read in two different translations, as you can see there. So first, NLT. So Mark 10, 7 to 9 says, This explains why a man leaves his mother, I'm sorry, his father and mother, and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one, since they are no longer two but one. Let no one split apart what God has joined together. And then Amplified takes a little bit of rubber band, stretches it, and says, for, the reason a man shall, for, for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother to establish a home with his wife together. They're doing it together, right? And the two shall become one flesh, so they are no, they are no longer two, but are united as one flesh. Therefore, what God has united and joined together, man must not separate by divorce. So, looking at that, I'll actually come back in a Let's just keep going with Philippians. Philippians 2, 3 to 8. And then I'll come, come backwards. Philippians 2, 3 to 8. It reads as follows. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of yourselves as thinking as others, I'm sorry, as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. <coughs> He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. In those verses, again, back to my point, basically focusing the beauty that could come in marriage, focusing on the needs of your spouse first, right? Um... In, in, in Mark, I, I, I said this before, but, you know, so this, I think the, the two becoming one, the video is talking about the concept of cleaving, uh, goes well beyond anything in terms of just the pure physical or sexual connection. It's, it's uh, I believe, God desiring two people to live, to bless, to help, to sacrifice, for one another and to do it well. And then when we look at this Philippians passage, 2, 3 to 8, I mean, there's so many things in this, and we were starting to talk about this during Growth Wednesday uh, this past week, but just a lot of things in there. If you read a passage, but then you just, like, strip each little part of it, almost make a list, and then look at each one of these things and say, like, okay, like, there's lots of tasty morsels in here. Like, how can I apply this to my life? Don't be selfish. These are things in our relationships that we should try to make true, that we wouldn't be selfish. 
then we should be trying to impress others. You know, don't don't love care for your wife well to get recognition of other people. Just do it to glorify God. Be humble. One aspect of what the word's teaching us in terms of that would be to think of others better than yourselves. So again, you know, I think it's echoing. Focus on the needs of your spouse first, right? That's only one application, but it's a, it's an application. Um, <clears throat> And then look at the life of Jesus. I mean, he wants us to live with the attitude like he had. I mean, he, he had equality with our Heavenly Father, but he didn't cling to it. He laid it down. He was obedient to the Father. Instead, he gave, his, gave up his divine privileges and took on the humble position of a slave and was born as a human, fully man and fully God. And he humbled himself in obedience to God. And so that should be our motivator to... Uh, commit to caring well for our spouse is just to walk in humility before before our God. That should be the reason. Another point that I want to make is this. So if you can grow in your ability to really be present and listen, God will show you his glory even more. I'm not good at this by default. I'm not. But I'm just telling you what he's teaching me. So maybe I'm preaching to somebody else here. Some of you are great listeners, so for that I applaud you and I'm jealous in some ways. But uh, if we really grow in our ability, so like the Holy Spirit dwells within the, the believer, we can all grow. Are you going to become a completely different person with every aspect of how God's created you like go away? Now like there's just our DNA and how God's made us and all these things. And some people are stronger and weaker, different things. But uh, we can all grow in, in our ability to, I believe, be present and to listen well. And when you do, God will show you his glory even more. And so, like, you know, there are moments in scriptures, you know, they go up the mountain, you know, show me your glory, God. Like, we've never had that moment. But I'm like, wow, if that was me, like, that was... <laughs> would have been amazing, right? But God shows us his glory in different ways. He doesn't need to like have like us shimmering and like with like radiant light and stuff. It's Moses' experience. But um, an aspect that I've seen is just being present with Jen and listening well. And it's again, we're talking about marriage, so I really want to focus on that, but this applies everywhere. With any relationship in your life right now, if you really are present and you really listen awesome things will happen. God will show you his glory in those, in those moments. So, again, I said I'm not good. I left my own natural instincts. I'm not good at uh, li listening. I'd be quick to talk. I'd be quick to do things. I'd be quick to take action. In and of those things, they're not always bad. You know, we're in a spot where, like, nobody says anything. Like, well, the person speaks first. Like, that's kind of helpful sometimes, right? But, really, the point here is, like, focusing on being present and listening to the other person. So God's teaching me when I'm able to, when I'm able to do that, there's immense power that can be harnessed when you really listen to your spouse and you're present with them. So I have three testimonies. Three testimonies, I'm going to give you three examples. So I don't just like say stuff, but even like in our journey group this morning, I tried to have moments where, you know, like I just open my life up and be like, here's some real stuff, and like try to relate to people. So hopefully these are moments where somebody in here can relate. But I believe that God's teaching me that he desires us to model, model being vulnerable in one another's safe place. So if you've ever heard that phrase, uh, I did, even before I was married. My first testimony goes there. So Jen was desperately crying one time and uh, desiring me to be her safe place. And uh, I'm, you know, struggling like a knucklehead, you know. Decided to cancel our first of two weddings. It took two to get married, but we got married. We finally figured out, praise the Lord. But... Um, her need was always there, but now I actually get it because God's been maturing me. So um, I see how even in my failure in that place, basically she was com communicating like, I need, I want to be able to be vulnerable with you and to be able to trust you. God took my failure, my epic failure of the past, and as he's maturing me, he's using it for good. The word teaches us this. He'll take all things and use them together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And so I would just challenge you today, anything that you've failed in, 
if you trust God and if you repent and if you go before the Lord, He can take it and use it for good in your life going forward. And that's what He would desire. He doesn't want you to look back and be like, I'm a moron. He's like, well, let's go. Let me take you where I want to take you. So that was one testimony looking back and seeing like, uh, but also seeing how God's using it. And then my second point in the more present, these both kind of happened in the last month. So um, that was her saying, hey, I need... I like I need you to be my safe place. And this is me going her saying, You are my safe place because I got this like blood test and uh, at least the first time in my life I could have had it been not known or whatever. But so my blood sugar was elevated and I was like, hmm, what's that all about? And then, you know, like inside, like I'm going off the rails with like, what could this mean? I'm like, I wanna be around, I like, got a little baby, and like, no, ah, I'm gonna take medications and blah 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 blah. All these things, you know, the, the work of the devil, like just chirping in your ear and stuff. But I remember just going to her, and this I think this is how it's supposed to be, like, not just be like, you're the dude, suck it up and like be a big boy and don't talk about your feelings, you know, you're a man. It's like, no, nah, it's like I'm gonna be like vulnerable for real for real. I remember like crawling into our arms and just bawling like a baby and she's like I'm, what the heck's going on here and stuff and I'm just like telling her probably through my tears and stuff like how I'm feeling and stuff and you know she's had honestly she's had some moments after that where she's like I guess she spent some time in like suburbs of Philly growing up but like I'm, I'm more from those roots so like I feel like I'm more like <coughs> tough love like Papa Sharp style but yeah. you have to know my dad he was the, the, the original Papa Sharp but um, she 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 had this ability to be like actually like firm and like give me a good kick in the butt and like in the moments where I'm like oh I was like I thought it was gonna be like this soft like tender moment you know but generally speaking she is and like if she wasn't I wouldn't have gone to her in that way and been vulnerable with her in that way and uh, and she did have words of encouragement and I think honestly what it was more is that she was just present with me listened and really didn't have a lot to say in that moment. But uh, we're meant to be like that. So if you're a dude, it's like, you know, be able to be raw and real with your, with your girl, man. And uh, you don't have to be some, you know, superhuman, you know, superhero guy. And I think we should, we're meant to be, be that for one another. And then my third testimony is this. So um, being present and listening, again, with my second point here. So we go on this Valentine's Day. And not just because it's like, ah, oh, you know, like Hallmark says, Valentine's a good day, you should go do something with your spouse, you know. And, well, it just, I, I know that that's a day, so like, I, I try to like look for a little sentimental, connected ways to do things. It just worked out that I was able to actually go out on Valentine's Day. Who cares if it was actually Valentine's or not? We had this, we went to this like little pizza shop, and it was like, uh, I mean, it was, it was random, like we had like a heart shaped pizza and heart shaped cake and like little balloons or whatever. There was some cool things that they did there, but it was still this random like, they didn't really take a lot of money, it was just like this moment. But the better thing that happened there was that I really, we got this seat that was kind of like out of the way and I didn't try to do that, but God created space and it was as if like I knew in the moment, it's like, just like sit down, shut up, our food's going to take forever, took forever. Right? And it was good when it came. It took forever. I mean, I think they even forgot about us at one point. It was like more than an hour later. I'm like, where the heck is the food? Thankfully, because usually I'm like really like, I'm ready to go. I'm going to eat. Where's my food? But I, uh, I just got lost in listening to her and talking. And uh, it was awesome. And so it was so basic. But like what was powerful, and, and I think women would reinforce this, but like our ability to, as men, to connect with them, to relate to them, and to just do that throughout a journey of a day. You know, things build in our relationship. It just makes, it's a beautiful thing, and it, it builds upon itself throughout the day. So, uh, but I looked back, I didn't go into the date saying, oh, this is, this is what I intend to do, I'm going to be the best listener in the world, and magic courage, and it's going to be an awesome date, my wife's going to love me. It's like, no, I just look back, and I'm like, huh, I did what I normally don't do. And I kind of like, didn't let the inconveniences of that night piss me off. And like, mm -hmm. I was just present, and it was beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, again, God taking all things and using them for good. And that's another example where I could just see evidence of it. So I, I really think, again, if we can be present and we can listen, she just had 
some things that she wanted to share that were on her heart, and I was very encouraged by them. Um, and she's not one always to be a super forthcoming. Like, I got like 15 topics, let's talk about it. That's more me. But she definitely had stuff on her heart that she wanted to share, and I was not an knucklehead guy away listen and listened to receive, and I think she really was benefited by that. So, anyway, things that I've learned in terms of how to do that um, that I've seen to be pretty powerful. One scripture, let's do that. James 1 19 to 20. <laughs> And we even have a James in here, so how's it feel to like that like scripture named after you and stuff, man? That's pretty cool. <laughs> There's a Joseph in the scripture, there's no like book of Joseph. You know, so James 1, 19 to 20. Again, I'll I'll be in Amplify, but you can look at whatever translation you've got going on there. Understand this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Let everyone be quick to hear, be a careful, thoughtful listener. Slow to speak, a speaker of carefully chosen words, and slow to anger, patient, reflective, forgiving. For the resentful, deep-seated anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God, or the sta- that, that standard of behavior which he requires from us. So much in that scripture. But I believe um, when we look at that very early part where it said, let everyone be quick to hear and be a careful, thoughtful listener. I think that's a really meaningful, connected point of two becoming one. Um, what, what does that mean to, to become one? Again, like I said, it goes beyond the physical connection. It, it's, it's what I experienced on that date. Be a careful, thoughtful listener. And God's telling us that's what he wants us to be. And we can't, we can't go wrong by embracing his word. When we embrace his word and apply it to our lives, I guarantee you 100% that you will be blessed. Right? All right, let's get down to land the plane here. Last point. Get you guys out of here. Keep you on schedule. So, my mind, this is going to be a really fast sermon, but you know, with me, I guess... Not much is fast sometimes, but it's talk. Anyways, thank you for your grace. The last point's this. Hey, I even underlined and highlighted the main word for you there. You see it in orange. We should be challenged to spur our spouses on to stay committed to connecting with God together. Key word, together. There's different ways to do that, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't connect with God individually. You should do that too. But I believe committing to caring well for your spouse is saying, hey, like, we should, like, spur one another on to be committed to connecting with God together. Can we do that? Can we do that? What does that look like? I don't know. Like, let's, let's talk about what that could look like. So I think it's, it's easy for us, uh, I find, as adults in a marriage to get pretty lazy. Um, well, I mean, you're not a marriage, you can get lazy, but certainly you can get lazy there. You get used to one another, and it just is what it is, I guess, at times. But don't let it stay there. You know, I know we have seasons, uh, things that get more difficult and whatnot. Um, and, I, and I don't care because I'm a pastor. I'm no better than anybody in this place, right? Let's just say that for what it is. Um, but again, men are, men are meant to leap. And yet both spouses are meant to love well and grow in this over their, the course of their marriage. Especially if you stay together until death does you apart, which was the vows that you had. Right? Um, so, both of us are meant to do this well. Uh, I, I believe that Holy Spirit has been teaching me that we need one another spurring on in love to encourage us to do this. So, encourage us to do what? Encouraging us both to connect together with God. Mm-hmm. How can we create space to connect together with God? Christ at the center. And staying committed to that, saying, you know, this should increase, this should not decrease, this should increase. Um, not because it's a Christian, do good, check a box, you know, collect two dollars, pass go, all that. No, what I'm saying is that it's it's something that is for our benefit. And when you have Christ at the center of everything in your life, you will have no better place. You'll be no greater supported than in that place. 
And at times, like I said, you need your spouse to carry you, to pick you up, to leave your safe place, to fall into their arms, whatever it is, but just staying committed to connecting with Christ in the center. So, um, some a picture of what some of those things could look like. So, I think um, there, there is, there's power in making this a priority. Um, and if you're saying, like, well, yeah, like, Pastor, that's me. Like, I want to do that. Let me do that. I want to, I want to do that in my marriage. Well, then, you know, there should be, uh, you need to discern the right time of the day. Uh, be consistent about creating a way to remind your spouse to make it a priority to pray together regularly. But, like, find the space that you can do where it's not just like, all right, get on with this. Like, be done with this. Like, some, some of us as Christians can just be like, you know, do it. Like, check, 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 check. All right, I did my thing. I'm going to show up at church. Boom, I'm out of here. But, like, no, like, a space where it's like, when can we both do this so we can actually just be present and do this together, right, in a meaningful way? Find what that looks like. You know the rhythm of your house. Look for that. And then if you're the man, I would challenge you, even though it's beautiful when the wife can come help us, it's like, you pursue her and be like, we need to do this. When can we do this? And try to make a recommendation, but then, you know, but, but stay on it. Like, for, for me, it's usually in the morning, early in the morning. But, like, but there's times, you know, different than yesterday. It's like, I found her later in the day. I was like, you know, it was bothering me that, that we didn't do it in, in the morning. But we need to be committed in this. And not just because I'm going to share this message, but I'm, I can be lazy. We can be lazy, but we shouldn't be, Right? And then you're asking one another, like, hey, how did that thing, that thing we prayed about, like, what happened? You know, it's like, but now she's, we're connecting you about things that we never would have connected about if we didn't actually spend that time together, right? There's power in that unity. That's part of that oneness to becoming one, where it's like, yeah, we have, two, I mean, two different lives. Your hearts are both beating, and you're both breathing oxygen, you're both alive and whatnot, but you're really one, functioning through this journey of life together. That is part of the mystery of marriage that's just the beauty that God wants us to have that I'm starting to understand as the years pass in my marriage. You could uh, draw your kids into it. And if you're just by yourself as a couple, all good. But then you have no distractions and less excuses. But we have a prayer box in, in our kitchen. And it's like little prayers that we put in there. And then we have a little journal we write down every time God's answered one. And and so, you know, hold hands together and let's pray for them. We'll all go in and pick one out and we like each pray for a different thing. And come up with your own way to do it. I don't know, but like <laughs> trying to show the kids that we're trying to um, not just be good Christians, but that there's power in prayer. And God answers prayers. He's a God who has and will always be there with us and for us. And so that the kids can understand that for themselves. But another connective moment with my wife, right? And with the kids, which makes it even more interesting. <coughs> uh, again, men should be leading and investing in, into the marriage. Don't wait for your wife to do it. I think it's cool when spouses come on with ideas of like, well, when Jen has an idea for me, I love it. She'll randomly, she's gotten better at it, she'll send me different things, and I'll put it in my little list of ideas of what we're going to do with dates or whatever, you know, all sorts of things. But, um, Men are supposed to lead, so just keep investing in your marriage. You know, it could be like, hey, uh, you know, I want to make sure that we we have uh, um, coming up with ideas, and maybe even playfully together, we're collaborating on some ideas of how we can go have fun together. But you know, it doesn't always work out. Life happens. You know, Joshua broke his arm two weeks ago. We were supposed to go away to Spruce Lake for this thing that we had planned, and we're both. Super looking forward to it. everything was ready to go. Car was ready to go. We didn't go, right? But I'm still investing in the marriage, and I, I ain't going to let something like that stop it, right? So uh, we, we were able to be there with just our one child and have a meaningful connection in the hospital with him. So God can shift things. But just be consistent. Look at how can I have consistent times away with my spouse? It could be marriage conferences. could be spiritual retreats. Um, shameless plug, weekend to remember if you've done it and you've been blessed by it, maybe you do it again. Uh, if you've never gone there, weekendtoremember.com, great uh, thing to do. Jen and I have done it. It's a great structure to a weekend to be blessed in marriage. Uh, maybe, you know, we did it in the past year, a renewal of your vows. Don't need to make a big ceremony or whatever, but it could be anything. 
date me regularly, planning dates uh, ahead, being intentional with it, like really thoughtful. I uh, didn't realize this, uh, so she told me after the last date. She was like, oh, you just checked off something off my bucket list. Now, for real, I actually had this list, and I'm like, okay, well, I don't think this was actually on the list. But there was, there was other things on the list that she didn't put on my list. But anyway, it, she, we did a sushi class, and just had to learn how to make your own sushi and stuff in, uh, at a culinary school, and she was just like, that was awesome. And I'm like, it was kind of neat. I, I wasn't too good at it, but it tasted all right. <laughs> Weird thing, you never actually made it. You gotta wash your rice for a really long time, like super long time. That's the key. Wash your rice. <laughs> anyway, but uh, yeah. So just she would have never said something like that if I wasn't modeling some of these things I'm describing, where it's like that's what it's meant to be, like. Go through the journey of life and have fun together and play together and figure out what that is. And sometimes you get it right. You know, like I did there. I always mess it up. So anyhow, a couple scriptures. Pastor Ryan, then, if you don't mind, maybe leave us in the song and kick us out of here. But a couple more scriptures. Just to ask you. No, no much. Two scriptures. Matthew 18, 20. And then Luke 12, 35. <coughs> So Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three are gathered in my name, meeting together as my followers, I am there among them. That's, you know, I think that fits the bill there. It could be two or three. And what I'm sharing there with you and your spouse come together in my name, meeting together. I am there amongst you. Where you and your kids get together, hold hands, and do your prayer box. As my followers, I am there with you. This is what God's reminding us. And so, a lot of the, the great scripts that God's got for us in here, you think of a doctor, he's got his scripts and whatnot. They're, they're in here, they're not too complicated. It's just like, there's a lot of little easy, you know, like easy buttons in the scripture. It's like, just do these things and like awesome things will happen in your life. It's just, it's, it's part of the cadence and flow of your life. doesn't mean you'll have no problems. It just means like these simple, beautiful things are there for God. Uh, God's made available to us for us to be able to leverage and be blessed by. And that last scripture in Luke, chapter 12, verse 35. This is about being in a state of readiness. Okay? Um, one of our missionaries in IHOP, International House of Prayer, not International House of Pancakes, um, shared this with Pastor Ryan and I recently in recent weeks, and it's been hitting me in numerous different areas of my life, but I felt like one I was supposed to bring it up here. So, something I'll say is a quick side note. People prophesy things over you. You read the Bible, things stand out to you. Harvest those things. And allow God to show you how to use them. I think at times when you get something, again, it's also something that you can share with other people. So uh, it says this, verse 35. Be dressed and ready for active service. <clears throat> and keep your lamps continuously burning. Go back to the front part of that. Be dressed and ready for active service. I'd argue your spouse can be one application there. Caring about their needs first. Be ready. Be intentional. Be relentless. Pursue their heart. Don't stop until you stop breathing. And keep your lamps continuously burning. It's a lifelong commitment. My uh, sermon again, committing to caring well for your spouse. Keyword, committing. So, to the end. If, if one of you passes first and you get married again, um, so be it. You know, I was reading a story earlier this week with a woman that had a very rare cancer battle, died, maybe younger than me, but definitely not old. And um, tons of people responded on social media. Like, it was just, you know, crazy. It was good. But she basically wrote something to her before she died. And she was like, if you're reading this, like, I passed. You know, but it was like something that was, she, she knew she was getting ready to die. And uh, it was it was powerful, but she she told her husband she's like you know, like go find somebody like you deserve it. you know like it's my word 
you know, and so there are situations where it can again, but the beauty of staying together through all the bumps, you know, there's just beauty in that. Don't let the world tell you something different. Battle and fight through things. Grow your marriage. Stay invested in one another. Commit to caring well for your spouse. And I believe that uh, if you're both doing that, you guys will have a beautiful marriage. Mm -hmm. And that's my encouragement to you today. Pastor Ryan's going to send us off with a song. I'd like to close in prayer. And um, I'll, I'll say that I'll be up here if anybody wants prayer uh, for their marriage, certainly. Um, if you want prayer for something else, I'm glad to pray for any need that's here in the house. Um, feel free to worship while he's leading us. Yeah, if you've got to go, we get it. Don't forget your kids. But um, we love you guys, and we appreciate you being with us. But it's good. Let's, let's pray. Father God, thank you that you, you are committed to us. You're the one who came first for us. You knew your mission, and you finished strong. You fulfilled every single thing that you were meant to fulfill. Every prophecy spoken over you, you fulfilled. And we worship you now. One way that we have the opportunity to worship you is through the covenant of marriage. And for each husband and wife that's in this house, I ask that you would spark something fresh within them, a passion to chase after their spouse with greater fervor, that you would be glorified, my God. I ask that you would give them a passion that shows them that the commitment that they have to their spouse reflects your glory in this world. And I pray that you put other marriages in their path, God, that they can sow into. I pray that you put single people in their path that are not married but one day will be and that they would help them to invest into their lives to contend for the beauty that we have been speaking about in this time we've shared. I ask, God, that no weapon formed against any marriage in this house would prosper in the mighty name of Jesus. I ask that the things that are the hard place moments in these marriages now, the things that we struggle with, where we will be selfish and we will not focus on the other person. I ask that you help us to unload our weapons, that we would lay them down, that there would be no place to talk poorly of our spouse, but that we would lift them up, that you would be glorified, God. Show us how to do this. And God, when we struggle... May we allow powerful relationships around us to invest into us, to encourage us, to spur us on, God. We need these relationships. Help us to cultivate these relationships, God. Help us to have no place where we make excuses why we don't have them or why we can't have them. Help us first to focus on how we can be them for other people. And I believe by faith that you will give them to us. And they will benefit our marriages. They will benefit our relationships. I pray, God, that you would give us a passion, Jesus, to keep you at the center of all things. Not just so our children can say that that's what they've been taught, but we are thankful for that. But, God, that we would show the upcoming generation what a God-ordained marriage is meant to be in this present age. We reject every high-minded nonsense that's prevailing in our society that speaks against this. You are God who does not change. You are the same today and forevermore. And may we honor you by how we honor one another in the marriage that you have given us and that one day you will give those that are yet to be married. I ask your blessing upon each person here in Jesus' name.